how much force is needed for a concussion to occur versus a whiplash. And the other, this is an amazing stat. I, I've heard you, you said this on my other podcast, the hybrid therapist podcast, greater than 70% of all impacts in NFL is less than 30 G's. Now in context, how much force is necessary for a concussion? So the, the studies that this comes from are usually um, accelerometers placed inside helmets. So there'll be six, six accelerometers inside a helmet that'll be passing information to a computer system on the sidelines. So it's the acceleration level of the helmet. Um, but we have done studies actually in AFL uh, players and rugby players, I believe with, um, like skin based accelerometers and the, and the stats are fairly similar. So I think we can pretty, pretty confident that the numbers are decently similar. Um, but the range of concussion, and this is usually in football players, high school, college football players is between 70 and 120 G's of linear acceleration. Um, there's, you know, prevailing thought that rotational acceleration is actually more important when it comes to concussion, I kind of think of it as more of a combination. It's whichever one passes the threshold is going to be the one that gets you right. So if you have a small amount of rotational, but you also have a massive linear, well, in your case, the linear probably resulted in the concussion, but anyway, so 70 to 120 G's of acceleration to put that in context for people, um, a sneeze is about three and a half G's. So if you were to sneeze and the movement of your head would be about three and a half G's, um, uh, there were some other ones that I used to, I used to have, Oh, the average header in soccer. So if you're going to go head a soccer ball, um, and you're aware that the ball is coming, the average header in like girls, like middle school soccer, and also it holds pretty true for college and high school as well is between 18 and 24 G's ish. So kind of well below the threshold required for concussion, right? And soccer is one of these sports that's putting headgear on people thinking it's going to solve their concussion problem, but it's, it's not necessarily going to do that. The G forces from heading are just far too low anyway. Um, whiplash Quick, quickly is, on that quickly. Yes. If so, if that's the case, if someone heads a ball 3000 times in their career or 10,000 times in their career, are you expecting them to not have any long-term deficits because of the regular heading, because the amount of force per head is actually quite low? Yeah, that's kind of, so there's this concept that you're getting into a concept called sub concussive impacts. Yep. So the idea of a sub concussive impact is that, you know, maybe it's not enough force to cause a concussion injury where you actually have clinical signs and symptoms of a concussion, but maybe those small hits over time are creating, you know, neurodegenerative disease or damage, et cetera. Now we haven't actually been able to prove that this exists. This is kind of more of a theoretical concept or framework that, and really what this came from is the CTE mm. uh, side of things. So, you know, CTE was first attributed to concussions and, and then it was, well, you guys aren't really looking at any control brains. You know, you're only looking at people that have had multiple concussions in their career and also have signs, symptoms of dementia, and those are the brains you're looking at. So the criticism became, well, you're not looking at anybody who doesn't have a history of concussions or anything like that. So then they started getting control brains. Well, you know, I played football, but I don't have any concussion history. Um, you know, here's my brain as a control. Oh, shit, there's CTE, mm. right? So rather than saying, hmm, maybe we're missing something, maybe this isn't related to concussions, maybe this is something different. Maybe this is related to, you know, other things that are associated with tau deposition, like opioids or yes, you know, I want to talk about steroids this. Steroids or alcoholism or, you know, um, all sorts of different things can cause, you know, tau deposition. So rather than kind of thinking along those lines, the researcher said, oh, it must be the sub concussive impacts. All the micro traumas happening over time have led to this neurodegeneration. So then there became this huge interest in repetitive head head hits, not necessarily concussion specifically, but just all the little, you know, hits. So now you have things like hit counters, you know, in, in, in sports where they're looking at not just the, the, the actual acceleration, but they're looking at just the volume of, of smaller hits over time. We don't really have any good evidence to suggest that sub concussive impacts do anything over time. It's purely speculative. Um, 
And to me, it, it, there's probably some threshold. Like if I think about this, I think that there's probably some threshold where something's going to happen, right? Like if I just tap my side of my head with my little finger like this, eventually will that cause brain damage? Probably not. Right. Like you need, you need to have some level of force. Now, if I were to, you know, do this back and forth for, you know, I don't know, years would that do anything <laughs> or do I need, do I need more than that? Right. So what's the threshold that actually becomes sufficient to create, let's say an inflammatory response of some kind, or, you know, what they call this kind of mi mi microstructural, you know, kind of little damage that may happen. There's probably some sort of threshold, right? So if you look at, let's say a G force spectrum, Concussion yep. is happening 70 to 120 G's. And actually, if you look even beyond 120 G's, now you're getting into subdural hematomas mm. and more severe forms of brain injury because those are also from acceleration, right? If you actually stretch that those cells too hard, they, they rip apart and now you have physical damage. If you stretch those blood vessels too hard, they rip apart and now you have bleeding, right? But concussion happens before that, right? So yep. when you first get that little stretch, you don't get any breaking, you just get the little stretch. Now, probably before you hit clinical symptomatology of concussion, maybe let's say between, you know, 50 and 70 G's, maybe now you're getting into maybe like a little kind of minor inflammatory response or a, you know, maybe a little bit of a stretch, but nothing clinically perceivable that's causing microstructure, right? But then below, let's say, you know, that, that 30 G's, you know, maybe you're not getting anything, but we don't mm. know you know, what is a subconcussive impact, right? And I read this paper and it was really interesting. They said, you know, defining something by what it is not yeah. <laughs> does not give us a good definition of what it mm. is, mm. right? Just saying that, well, it's subconcussive. That just means it's a force less than concussion. Exactly. So what does this mean? Like if I, if I have a sneezing fit and I sneeze five times in a row, that's three and a half G's each time. Is that going to add up now to cause brain? No, it's not. Like, I just don't believe that it can. So you so, think that you think the thresholds around that 30 G's and under, you would say that it's, it's, I know it's so hard to say, but, but by, by the sounds of what you're saying to me right now, that repetitive headers in soccer probably aren't going to be enough force for a subconcussive knock to accumulate. I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume so. Yeah, I, well, I just, this is such an important point because I feel like so many people think these type of things are going to cause, you know, long-term issues. And even for me, you know, when I had to retire, I thought little knocks to my head here and there were going to give me a concussion. Like if someone accidentally bumped into my head or something like that, or I hit my head on the, you know, a, a bench or anything, I was mm -hmm. like, oh shit, that's giving me a concussion. But it's just not enough force, is it? No. No. I did a podcast last week and I called it, um, you, you are not that fragile Yeah. because it's just, it's you, you need in order for a concussion to happen, you need to have the brain accelerate to a sufficient enough level that you actually stretch the brain cells to a sufficient enough amount mm. that you get, you get the membrane of the neuron to deform enough that you're going to get ion exchange because before that you just haven't done anything. Do you know what I mean? Like there's just, there's nothing that has occurred, right? Your, your brain has moved around, but it actually hasn't stretched anything to a sufficient enough degree to cause depolarization, which then becomes the concussion injury. You just, you need, you need a tremendous amount of force to get the brain to stretch to that degree. Yeah. So little bumps, things like that. Like it just, it's just not enough, not enough force. Now people will get symptom flares when this happens, right? Especially if you've had concussion before or you're dealing with persistent symptoms, somebody bumps you, you're gonna get potentially a flare in symptoms. Now, that's not necessarily another concussion injury. That could be a whole bunch of different things, right? We talked about whiplash being less forced. The symptoms of concussion and whiplash are identical. A lot of patients with persistent concussion symptoms actually have just ongoing whiplash issues that are causing the same symptoms. So they think it's brain, but it's actually neck related. So if you have a neck dysfunction, somebody bumps you even slightly, neck dysfunction can happen with less force. So, you know, a good sneeze can throw your neck out, right? You can sleep on your neck wrong and wake up, not be able to, to move it. Right. So these little bumps may jar your neck a little bit, which may then start to make your muscles tense up around your neck, which then starts to give you headaches, starts to affect how your eyes move, starts to make you feel dizzy and off balance, which then creates, you know, anxiety. Oh crap. I've done this again. Anxiety. A lot of people hold tension in their necks. 
anxiety will cause the same symptoms, confusion, fogginess. You can't think straight when you're in an anxious kind of panic state. So then all the symptoms start to manifest and you think I've damaged my brain again. Mm -hmm. But if you take a step back and understand that you actually need quite a bit of force to create that response, then it's probably something else, right? People can have visual vestibular mismatch where you know little knocks will kind of create this 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 off kind of sensation. People can have um, um, like in like there's these kind of minor inflammatory responses, right? That can kind of flare up again and cause fogginess and stuff. So usually it's not another concussion; it's something else that may have happened as a result of your first concussion, but it's just something else being provoked as a result of that. It could be just a pure up, straight up anxiety response that causes all the things to kind of come out again, mm -hmm. right? P people with anxiety can think that they're having heart attacks. People with anxiety can think that, you know, all sorts of crazy things and the symptoms will manifest with exactly that. that. So um, anyway, that's kind of a, that was a bit of a sidebar, but. Mm -hmm.